in the first place. If I had the shits, I certainly wouldn't be looking for a booty call at 4am. I'm staying the fuck home, riding out the storm in my poop closet where no one can hear or smell anything. I'll elaborate on all of this in the theory part, but as of right now, 100%, I believe that door was left unlocked for a very foul reason. There is no explainable, innocent reason that I have been made aware of as to why she did this. Her whole story is utter bullshit. I'm not buying what she's fucking selling, and honestly, it doesn't seem like anyone else is either. So now we're on to the next morning. It is now roughly 10.30 a.m., on September 7, 2012, and Karina's waking up and she decides she wants to start making calls and trying to arrange a ride home for herself. She attempted to call Faith, but that call went unanswered. So Karina then calls another random friend of hers named Marisol, who was able to come scoop her up and drive her back to the apartment. They arrive there a little before 11 a.m. Karina and Marisol enter the apartment and call out to Faith and obviously they get no response, so they decide to make their way into the bedroom. That's when they discovered Faith. She was found lying on the bed face up. Her head was hanging off the bed, and there was blood pooling on the ground underneath. She was naked from the waist down, had a black t-shirt pulled over her head, and she was wrapped in a quilt. It's just weird. I read that, and I was like, what the fuck? Um, what stood out to me, though, was the t-shirt and the quilt. It seems there were several attempts at covering her, her face up, both with the shirt pulled over her head and her being wrapped in the quilt. That is usually seen in cases where the attacker feels guilt or shame or even in some circumstances remorse for what they did, and it usually indicates that they knew them on some sort of level. I just thought that was an in- interesting observation that I hadn't even seen mentioned in any of my readings thus far. Now, it's said that Karina immediately called 911. The recordings have since been released, and the person who calls in is seemingly crying and distraught, saying there was blood everywhere, and their roommate is, quote, unconscious, which to me is a little weird of a statement. If there's a pool of blood on the ground under her badly beaten head, and you keep repeating that there's blood everywhere... I think it's safe to say she's not unconscious. I'm thinking probably dead. But maybe that's just me. She also says that it definitely looked like someone had been in there. I'm sorry, but like no fucking shit. She obviously didn't do it to herself. Oddly enough, there is a ton of speculation that the female on the phone to 911 is not in fact Karina, but Marisol, who gave Karina's name for unknown reasons. There is no evidence to support this, but it is a widely popular theory I saw circulating, and I felt it should be mentioned and maybe even considered, given her actions leading up to this point. People are also questioning why the girl stayed in the apartment after the discovery. Most people's reaction to finding their friend brutally murdered in their bed is to get the fuck out of there. You don't know if the killer's still in there or what the fuck is going on, but you're not about to find out. But apparently, the girls just chilled in the apartment until the police arrived. Now, the 911 dispatcher did tell them to sit on the couch and wait for police to arrive, so it makes sense why they would stay in the house if they were genuinely distraught and just listening to what the dispatcher was telling them to do. So, I felt I needed to put that in there just for the people who thought it was weird that they originally stayed in the apartment. So, police arrived and they started processing the scene. Now, most of the information regarding what they found that night was not made public, or morning, wasn't night, it was morning, wasn't actually made public for some time. It wasn't until July of 2014, two whole ass years later, that the records around her case were finally unsealed. Chapel Hill police have come under lots of scrutiny for the way they handled the investigation, and honestly, I can see why. I understand the importance of protecting the case in order to eliminate the chance of any hindrance, but this seemed drawn out, and the repeated requests for the records to be sealed and it being granted felt like it was more of a dog burying his shit because he knows he fucked up type of scenario. That's just my opinion. Doesn't mean that that's actually what happened, but that's what it looks like from all the way over here almost 10 years later. 
So just keep that in mind that mainly all of the um, upcoming information wasn't released until at least two years later. Police noted that Faith had been severely beaten in the head and face. It was pretty bad from all accounts. On top of the blood pooling underneath her head, there was blood spatter found on the walls and the closet doors in the room. Faith had cuts and bruises on her arms and legs, and blood was found underneath her fingernails. When you hear that, it just makes it so much more real because this poor girl fought for her fucking life. I sincerely hope she fucked whoever it was up. A giant, empty Bacardi peach-flavored rum bottle that the girls kept in the kitchen was found with face tissue fragments on it and has long since been the suspected murder weapon. I was kind of surprised to hear that the bottle was intact. With how vicious her beating was, I feel like that shit would have just busted at some point. But then again, I've never beaten someone to death with a bottle before, so I have no first-hand experience of its successfulness as a weapon, but needless to say, it just kind of stood out to me. A little surprised. DNA was found at the scene, though. In some cases, it sounds like two forms of the same DNA profile were found. Overall, it is stated that semen was found either in or on Faith. Most accounts state that they performed a sexual assault kit, and with the DNA from that, they were able to match it with other male DNA found within the apartment. I don't know if that was more semen, or if it was hair, or blood, or saliva, or, or what form of DNA it was, but it was found elsewhere, including a ballpoint pen in the apartment. Now, the ballpoint pen became important, important, important because the pen was actually used to write a very ominous note that was left at the crime scene on a fast food bag. The white paper bag was found near Faith, surprisingly with not a single speck of blood on it. In sloppy, all capital letters were the words, I'm not stupid, bitch, jealous. Uh, Okay. I get the general idea of the message, but holy hell, that is weirdly worded. To me, it reads more feminine. Again, my opinion only. I feel like a guy would have written something that didn't have to do with jealousy. Girls aren't really jealous of guys. Girls are jealous of girls. Just a little known fact. Now, the writing is very hastily written. It is written with, I'm not stupid on one line i had like typed that out very stupidly ironically (laughs) so that was hard to read uh under it is bitch and then under that is the word jealous again it reads weird kind of like a grocery list or a haiku (laughs) because those are very similar things i'm not sure what the goal was with the word placement but it's creepy and it tells me things so right off the bat eric is looking like a prime candidate for this kid for this cry i can't talk dear god we're gonna scratch that start again so right off the bat eric is looking like a prime candidate for this crime he's got a motive for sure he knows where she lives and he's broken into the apartment twice before please also find out that the night before eric sent this very random and ominous text to someone asking for forgiveness quote for what I am about to do. He also posted the same quote on Twitter. And then three days after the murder, he changed his Facebook banner to read, Dear Lord, forgive me for all my sins and the sins I may commit today. Protect me from the girls who don't deserve me and the ones who wish me dead today. I love how he is like suddenly the poor broken man in this situation. Like, shut the fuck up, dude. Don't beat on women. How about that be your Facebook banner? Faith is over here dead, but Lord protect him from women that don't like him. What a fucking dramatic ass moron. I don't know why, but that just annoyed the fuck out of me when I read it. But anyway, the police go after this idiot, armed with the DNA profile from the crime scene. They request his DNA sample, and it's said that initially he was not willing to give it up. But at some point, he did comply, and they ran his DNA to see if it was a match. Now, obviously, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about this case if it was a match. So, they cut him loose, and are just like, what the fuck, and honestly, same. His sample just, I guess, didn't match. They were able to rule him out as a suspect. 
They even tested Brandon's DNA as well. And along with several known men that were there at the thrill that night, around the same time as Karina and Faith, all were no match. Something like 750 people had their DNA tested in this case, and all of them came back as no matches, which is fucking bewildering to me. I don't know how. But anyway, in the first week of the investigation, the university's board of trustees, local crime stoppers, the Haliwa Saponi tribe, and the apartment complex the girls lived in all pooled their money together and offered a $29,000 reward for any info that would lead to an arrest in this case. Sadly enough, back in 2008, a student by the name of Eve Carson was murdered also, also like on, near or on campus, it didn't say. Eve was the university's undergrad student body president, and at the time they were able to raise a $25,000 reward for her case that subsequently led to the arrest of her two murderers. So police were kind of hoping they would have the same success here, but that wasn't the case. Two months later, the governor's office added an additional $10,000 to that reward money, bringing it up to $39,000, and still, there hasn't been anything. So like I mentioned earlier, this case had a lot of drama going on with the court sealing the records for almost two years after the murder. In November of 2012, the student newspaper at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, called the Daily Tar Heel had filed a petition to request that the sealed records be released, particularly in regards to the early search warrants that had been issued. Now, not only did the judge deny the petition, but they actually resealed the files for another 45 days. There's no reason given as to why, but at the time, Chapel Hill police, police hadn't even released Faith's cause of death. I cannot talk tonight. Uh, her family were actually the ones who told media outlets that her death certificate stated blunt force trauma as the cause of death. Now, fast forward to January of 2013. Police officially announced that the DNA that was found at the scene came back as male. At this point, the FBI is mentioned. I said that weird. The FBI is mentioned as developing a profile of the perpetrator based on the crime scene and evidence found. They believed the man lived near Faith at some point in the past and had maybe expressed an interest in her, but that his behaviors may have changed since the crime, including showing an unusual interest in Faith's death. By May of 2013, the court decided to extend the seal for another 60 days. Come September 2013, a full year since her murder, Chapel Hill police finally admitted that they were in over their head and they requested help from the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation, who actually had helped on the case initially in the beginning. The chief states, quote, we're working this case hard and we've used all possible resources. However, they don't give any new information about the case. November of 2013, the Tar Heel notes in the newspaper that Faith's case remains open and unsolved, along with another death on campus. Jesus Christ, three students within 10 years, all from the same college campus, sounds excessive to say the least. But the death of David Shannon, who was suspected of being a victim of hazing and had subsequently fell to his death. The Heel pointed out there, there had been no new developments in the case since January of that year, but that Faith's case still for some reason remained sealed. March of 2014, the Tar Heel then joined forces with Rayleigh News and Observer and Capital Broadcasting Company to essentially confront the district attorney's motion to extend the seal on Faith's case yet another 60 days. They argued that basically the police and the district attorney didn't want to admit that the case had gone cold and at this point, keeping what they had discovered so far was just hurting the case more than it was helping. The district attorney, however, argued back that releasing the details of the case so far would do more damage than good. Ultimately, the judge ruled in favor of the district attorney, and the records remain sealed. However, during this hearing, the district attorney did have to file specifics as to what the police had done thus far, giving the media their first opportunity to report on Faith's case with factual evidence that had been discovered during the death investigation. The next month, a woman by the name of Chelsea Delaney, who was a reporter for the Tar Heel and had reported on Faith's, Faith's murder at the time it had happened, wrote an article on a media platform basically calling them out on their shady shit of sealing the records this whole time. 
She said she felt that the only reason they were sealing the records was to hide their...